We're out here. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Winnetka Village Council regular meeting for January 7th, 2020. I'd like to call the meeting to order and request that everybody either turn off or mute your cell phones or other electronic devices. And we'll start out with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, quorum check. Rob, you want to run through? Okay, um, January 14th and 21st. I'm questionable on the 21st. Okay. And then February 4th. I'll look okay? Yep. Sounds good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, public comment. This is the time of the evening where anybody uh, in the audience who wishes to address the Village Council on any item that is not on the agenda they're welcome to come on up to the microphone and share their thoughts with us. Would anybody like to uh, address council this evening on, on non-agenda items? Come on up, Pat. Cheery New Year greeting to everybody. On the way up here, driving up Oak Street, I saw the, the Christmas tree, and it looks just gorgeous tonight. I just wanted you to know that. It's so pretty. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address Village Council? Seeing none, I will close public comment and we'll move on with reports. Uh, why do I feel like we're missing something here? I'm out of, I'm, I'm, I'm out of practice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, trustees, Jack, any report? No report. Andy? No report. Bob? No report. That's quick. Uh, Village Attorney? No report tonight. Village Manager? No report this evening and Village President. I do have one announcement. Uh, I am tentatively, actually our, our stormwater team is tentatively <coughs> scheduled to uh, uh, provide a presentation to the uh, Winnetka Park District Board on January 16th to review the potential stormwater improvements on their, on their uh, various properties uh, related to stormwater. So that'll be on the 16th of March. It's a fairly comprehensive January. January. I'm sorry. Uh, it's a fairly comprehensive uh, uh, proposal. And if anybody's really interested, I think that this is. If there's one you don't want to miss, I would say this one is probably the one to to come out and uh, share your comments and thoughts about that. Is that a 7 meeting? Uh, I. That's a good question, Bob. I, there'll be more, and we'll make sure we post it up on the website. They typically they they, they meet early. It's usually a five or a six meeting usually, right? Okay. So, uh, but we may end up asking them to move it to a, an evening just to make sure, later in the evening, just to make sure uh, anybody interested can come out and uh, uh, see what we have to offer there. Okay, item six, approval of the agenda. Does any trustee wish to move an item on the consent agenda for a separate vote? Seeing none. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the final form of the agenda? So moved. Voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? That motion carries. Uh, item 7, the consent <coughs> agenda. I will ask the clerk to read the items on the consent agenda. Approval of the Village Council meeting minutes for <coughs> December 10th, 2019 study session and the December 17th, 2019 regular meeting. Approval of the warrant list dated December 13th through uh, December 13th, 2019 through January 2nd, 2020, in the amount of $2,968,825.64. Resolution number R3-2020, 10th extension of the Landscape Waste Hauling Contract for adoption, and resolution number R4-2020, approving the purchase of a Ford F-550 truck from Sutton Auto Group for adoption. Great. Okay, uh, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda by omnibus vote? So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Trustee Collard Archie? Uh, aye. Trustee Cripe? Yes. Trustee Dearborn? Yes. Trustee Lanfear? Yes. Carries. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, moving right along. Ordinances and resolutions. Ordinance number M1 2020, 1015 Tower Court, Seoul, 
and Luna special use permit. This is up for introduction and possible adoption. The village has re received an application for a special use permit to allow a wellness center at 1015 Tower Court located in the retail overlay zoning district and formerly <laughs> occupied by Sawbridge Studio. Community Development Director David Schoen will walk us through it. David? Uh, <clears throat> uh, yes. Uh, so uh, just to show a location map of where this space is, um, it's off of uh, Tower Road on Tower Court. Um, it was uh, the rear half of what was formerly the Sawbridge space. It does not include the retail space on Green Bay Road. Uh, the space is about 3,400 square feet. Um, the property is located outside of the overlay district. Um, Therefore, it needed special use approval, and it required a review by both the Plan Commission and the Zoning Board of Appeals um, of that request. Um, the applicant provides a variety of daily self-care and wellness services, and the applicants are here, and they can elaborate on that. Um, in the materials, we uh, provided you information on their general hours of operation. Um, it's mainly by appointment um, and uh, usually it's serving a client at a time, though on occasion they will have uh, group activities when they may bring in a speaker or a special uh, person to talk about wellness. Um, the zoning board uh, and the plan commission both uh, unanimously recommended approval and during their uh, public hearings, uh, no members of the public came out and spoke on the request. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, before I ask for the applicant, uh, do you have any questions for David? Would the applicant like to address council and help us understand a little bit better what you guys are up to? <laughs> <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, my name is Amy Bradley. This is my business partner, Jessica Dietrich. And um, yeah, so we have been sort of uh, going through the motion of putting this idea together based on our own personal health and wellness journeys and also some emerging trends that we've noticed in the area, um, specifically some of the suburban uh, suburbs surrounding Winneka. And um, I don't know how, I'm, I apologize, I'm not sure if you guys all received the packet and mm -hmm. had the opportunity to read everything. So um, do you want to say anything? There? Sure. I mean, uh, basically, I think part of the reason why we're here and for the special application is the size of the space. Had we been under 2,500 square feet, we would probably be roped under the personal fitness. But because it's over that is why we're applying for the special use permit. Um, so we'll have a variety, as you can see in the picture, and I'm sure you guys have read, we'll have a variety of different modalities for people to come into some daily meditations. We have a tea service, no food service, except for already prepackaged grab and go. Um, there will be a selection of curated retail. Um, so uh, we wouldn't say that that is the majority of the space. There will be a good section of it. And I do think through word of mouth um, and also just marketing, we, I'm, we're not concerned with the location being off of Green Bay Road. In fact, we think we fit really well and complement a lot of the businesses that are currently located right there. Do we have any questions? Uh, yeah, I have a couple. Sure, sure. I, I noticed the, the, the list of services, a lot of exotic things that I've never heard about <laughs> before. Uh, but you, you said this is all by appointment, so somebody would, would, would go online and look at what you offer and say, I want a, a cosmic laser face rub sort of thing or <laughs> yes and nothing too crazy or invasive everything is very um I, want, I don't want to say superficial but nothing that would require any sort of medical training we're not getting into anything too too crazy but to that point yes to answer your question it would be by appointment however as brian um just or david sorry um just also addressed that we would have daily meditation which would also you know, it, from time to time, maybe once or twice throughout the day, we may have more than, you know, a handful of people in the studio at a time, while also offering some retail. So we would have um, a couple. You know, we hope to have a couple clients in this space at a time. But the staff, but the space would be staffed from absolutely a regular, 
regular business hours? Yes, yes. We expect two to three employees at all times. Great. And walk-ins, too. I know you said appointments, but also walk-ins are welcome, too. Oh, so that, that was the other question. Um, yep. Punch cards. A lot of, um, part of what this came out of, too, is just kind of our own market research. There are some places that already exist like this, um, definitely on the coast, New York and L.A. There's a lot uh, popping up in Chicago. And then most of the people that we've talked to in the area, there are some in Highland Park. Um, we've Walmart. got Auto Float and Wilmette. So a lot of people are leaving the area to go to all these different appointments, and we're kind of bringing a lot of them together under one roof and making it local and convenient. You'll hear uh, the term self-care quite a bit right now. That's a very trendy term, but that's kind of what we're playing on to. You know, this idea that we live in a very busy and high stressful area, and it, <laughs> while it comes with many, you know, amazing things, oftentimes people don't carve out a little time to take care of themselves. So it gives them an opportunity. Slow down. Well, I know our, uh, our, our recently former uh, Trustee Wedner would have been all over this. And <laughs> this is the sort of thing that she was really passionate about bringing to the community. So, any other questions for the applicants? I'm just doing some self care for a paper cut here. Oh, ah, there we, we go. got stuff for that. But don't worry. You can cry about it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Actually, the only, we have too the only much paper. question I had, and maybe, David, <laughs> yes. you could help on this. The only confusion, I think it's great. You know, good luck Thank with you. the, with the Thank business. You. Um, but I was, you did your own parking study, which yeah. I thought was. Kind of interesting. Yes. Um, I hadn't seen that before, where someone does the analysis hours Very hour and so on and so forth. And, <laughs> but I'm kind of interested, David, how this will work when they have the group, potentially 20 people right. okay. at a group session. There are other businesses back there that require parking. You talked about employees parking on, or people parking on Green Bay Road or by McDonald's. Uh, is David, in your mind, is there any parking issue here that could be problematic for other businesses in the area back there? Um, no, we didn't find that, and, and Steve also looked at it, and we didn't find there'd be it'd be problematic. A, a number of those activities would occur in the evening, okay. uh, when a lot of those other businesses aren't in operation. Mm. So, um, it's an opportunity to share parking by differences in peak usage. Okay, and the employees that you have, will they be local employees? You'll Residents, or what? Are your, what's your thought on that? Aside from the two of us, yes. yep. no, that is the hope. Um, we haven't. We're just in the. We obviously wanted to get through this phase before we started um, putting out the feelers, but we absolutely would love to hire locally. Uh, and obviously, Jessica and I live in the neighborhood, so it's really convenient for us in terms of our. You know, we do have young children, um, so we will be able to kind of be flexible with people in the area, work schedule wise. But one other thing on the parking too: um, a large portion of the parking lot back there is reserved for permit parking for the train for the zone so again being on different hours and also weekend use would be a lot of these workshops I think we would have a plenty of parking in that regard so okay, good thank you um, I think this is picking up you know picking up Anne's you know <laughs> tail coat or whatever uh, coattails um, um, I, I think this is a really great um, service to add to the retail offer offerings um, in Winneka. So I think this is really terrific. Um, I also, um, speaking to <laughs> to the parking study that you all did, I I, um, I hope we can continue to work on having for the less sophisticated uses that people don't have to hire. Um, so I think that's um, this is good for us if we can you know try to be a little more business friendly. It was um, a lot of hourly drive -bys. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. Storm, I know. It was I've, okay. sat out, I've sat out and counted, you know, way back in the day for Crow Island, I, you know, counted cars too. So, um, so it's great. It's and you have a really good appreciation for what it's what it's like. Um, so I, um, I, I think that's it. This is great. Um, and I think going forward, if we find that there are um, parking conflicts and stuff, I mean, there are you know there is commuter parking back there so maybe over time we'll have to look at reallocating or whatever but um uh i think this is a good addition great thank you thank you good luck I thank you very much we yeah. appreciate it and we we're, we're signing chris up for that cosmic laser yeah. oh don't worry yeah, right? be our first client <laughs> <laughs> should we sit down okay. uh yeah i don't get that stuff at all but... Okay, uh, I'll open it up. Any uh, comments or questions from uh, folks in the audience? Can anybody like to speak on this item? Come on up, Pat. The services you intend to offer are very forward-looking. 
I'm just wondering, are you or any of your employees planning to be certified as estheticians or other uh, professions requiring certification? Best wishes. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Anyone else? Okay, we'll close up public comment. Uh, any last thoughts up here? If not, uh, there's a potential here, at least I'm given an option on my, my cheat sheet, uh, to see if there might be an interest in waiving introduction. Yes. Uh, yes. And to do so, I would need a motion to waive introduction to ordinance number M1-2020. So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Trustee Collard Archie? Aye. Trustee Cripe? Yes. Trustee Dearborn? Yes. Trustee Lamb Fear? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Motion carries. So then may we, we can move forward. And may I have a motion to adopt ordinance number M1 2020? So moved. Second. Ro no. Mm -hmm. That's a roll call vote? To adopt. To adopt? Yeah. Uh, roll call vote. All yeah. those in favor? I need a roll call. Trustee Collard Archie? Yes. Trustee Cripe? Yes. Trustee Dearborn? Yes. Trustee Lamphere? Yes. Boy. Here, Andy, come on back. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just we'll just change seats and everything will be fine. <clears throat> so that's it. But you're trying. Chris. That's it. Uh, for motion me. carries. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are done here. Yep. Uh, best of luck, and we look forward to your grand opening, and, and uh, make sure everyone knows about it so we can come down and... and and, and celebrate. Thanks for coming. Always nice to see new businesses coming into the community. Mm -hmm. Okay, ordinance number M20, M2 2020, 419 and 429 Sheridan Road. This is a consolidation final plat, variations, and a special exception. This is up for introduction and adoption. Uh, this application for a final plat of subdivision proposes to consolidate two lots into one and also requests several zoning variations. Uh, here to review this is Community Development Director David. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the properties in question are along Lake Michigan. Uh, they're shown here. Um, and they're both zoned R2 uh, single family residential. As uh, President Rentz indicated, uh, they are proposing to combine the two lots into one lot, uh, which is one of the relief that one form one form of the relief that's required. Uh, whoops. Um, also related to that, uh, when a new lot is created, we evaluate it for its compliance with the zoning regulations of that district. Um, <clears throat> the existing home. Um, um, there on the, the south end or the, the bottom end um, was already a non-conforming house and that it didn't meet the minimum side yard setback. So that's an existing condition. Um, when we combine a lot, um, the lot in this instance has gotten wider and um, there is a minimum side yard, total side yard setback um, for a zoning lot. So when it gets bigger, that increases. Um, so in this instance, um, uh, it has increased to around 66 feet, that requirement. So with the minimum of 12 feet on the south or bottom end, the remainder of that would have to be on the, in the northern portion of the site. And therefore, uh, uh, some of the existing improvements fall within that area. And then they're also proposing a pergola within that area. Therefore, they need a, a variation. Um, for uh, that requirement. And then in addition, um, there's an ex existing condition um, today, but when uh, uh, recent or previous improvements had been made, uh, they complied with the front yard along the lake. Uh, but given the lake has risen, um, uh, the shoreline has shrunk 
and therefore those improvements are closer than the minimum so not by anything that the property owner did but because of the rise of uh, lake water and how we measure the front yard from the water's edge um, <coughs> that that is not conforming right now so thus we're, we're granting them another variation and then the last item um, that is being requested is uh, the village's um, code allows for a uh, home to have or a lot to have two driveways onto a public street. Um, the applicant is requesting, uh, they had two on the southern lot and the northern lot had one, and they're requesting that um, all three of the driveways remain. And the council has to give that approval for them to, um, to leave uh, the three current driveways, and that is also in the um, ordinance approving uh, the relief. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for David? <clears throat> um, I have a question relative, uh, if you can go back to the, um, there we go, thank you. Um, a couple questions. One is um, the existing pool accessory building. So that is currently attached to the northern um, house, is that correct? Correct. And so that's staying. There's nothing that is changing about the Correct. pool accessory building. The house will go down, but the pool accessory building is going to stay? Yes. Okay. And there aren't any changes being made to that? No. I mean, there's some landscaping <clears throat> changes around there, and I'll let the applicant address that. Okay. Um, and then the second question is that, um, <laughs> you know, I'm not excited about having, um, you know, the three curb cuts particularly along a really busy um, stretch of, you know, from a pedestrian standpoint, a really busy stretch of Sheridan. Um, what would be the purpose of keeping that northernmost um, driveway? Um, uh, to access that portion of the lot, and I'll let uh, them elaborate that okay. on that on, in terms of their design. Yeah, I'd like to understand that a little better. Thank you. Those are the two questions I had. David, question, um, and uh, this is a beautiful home, and it'll be a beautiful addition and landscaping and so on. But hypothetically, if someone wanted to subsequently tear everything down and build a new home on the property, this hypothetically, that would be a brand new zoning issue. These variances would mean nothing in that circumstance. Correct. Yeah, these variances are just granted for these specific improvements. Okay. Good. Over here, anything? Oh. Uh, okay, I was wondering if uh, the applicant might like to address. Come on up. Yes. Hi. Um, and first thanks of for. All, first of all, I'd like to say I, I this is a very interesting plan. So I, I just want you to know that I'm, I, you know, I think it's great, but I just wanted to understand it better. Yeah, sure. Um, we. Um, I'm sorry, sir. Could you? Did, yeah, I'm sorry. It's. it's I'm, I'm uh, the, the owner, uh, Manir Satter. Oh. Um, you know, one thing I, I want to be clear is that these non-conforming things, every single thing that we've ever done with this home since we moved into this community has been approved. So the existing pool building was approved at the time. The boathouse was approved at the time. I really wish I could make that lake go down two or three feet. <laughs> and I know we all do. Because right, exactly. <laughs> we're losing our, you know, the, the community's losing its beach. But... Um, but those are only non-conforming because of what happened subsequently to uh, to the approvals. Um, a previous owner had sunk a barge in front of our house, which we viewed as very dangerous. We spent uh, a lot of money to have that removed. That was just blatant disregard for village rules. We, we've always complied with every single rule that the village has had. Um, the issue here is, um, to my surprise, when we went to do this plan, I found out that we could build a house, and that was okay. But we couldn't build a pergola. <laughs> um, and the reason we can build a house is if it has um, a bedroom and a bathroom, then it's a house, and then you don't consolidate the lots, and that's okay. So we can take up a lot of space to build a home, but we can't have a pergola, and I, I wish we could show you the the presentation, the whole thing, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a beautiful open, it's meant to be a very open space. But what happened is when we did that, it forced us to consolidate. And once we were forced to consolidate, the setback went from 12 feet to 
to 56 feet. Right. So all of a sudden, we couldn't build even the pergola. Right. So we have a choice here, which is to build a house or build a pergola. Um, and so, you know, sort of, it, it was a surprising thing, but, you know, it's the village rules. Um, I would also say, with respect to your question on the driveway, um, this home was built in 1928. Mm -hmm. um, I hope nobody ever tears it down. It, it is um, protected um, because we did get uh, um, historic uh, preservation status for it. So I hope it will always be protected and not torn down. It, made, made, it kind of chilled my bones when I heard you say that. Um, but what we did with the uh, driveways is we have uh, columns there. Um, and so on that north driveway, we asked the village if they wanted us to do the exact same driveway columns that would have been in, done in 1928, which would be, um, which would not conform with code at that time because they were too high. Mm -hmm. And what the committee did is said, yes, we would like you to do it as it would have been done in 1928, and, and we're going to give you the ability to do that. So we did put those columns in at, at quite a bit of expense, and we're going to and we have a driveway there um, because that was access, it is access right now to that home. There will be parking there, which will, you know, get cars off the street, contractors off the street, et cetera, because we're right on Sheridan Road, so we don't. You don't need street parking, right? Yeah, and the two driveways um, that are at the current house have always been there. It's always been kind of a circular drive. Got it. Um, so I, I, I understand what you're saying about the curb cuts, but there are already curb cuts that are there, and they will take traffic and, and uh, contractors and, and, and so forth, and um, uh, teenage kids. I've got five teenage daughters. Oh, my God. Um, so, yeah, bless my wife. I had it rough with um, you. Got it. You got me. <laughs> so so we're, we're, I think that will hopefully be useful in terms of taking traffic off the street, and, and that's, that's what it's meant to be. We didn't mean to necessarily have to consolidate the the lots, mm -hmm. but we got you know forced into it because we don't we're not building a second house. Um, but again, if we did build a second house, we wouldn't we we, we could actually go do that. Um, so that did that answer all your questions? Um, and the last question, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to hear a little more um, explanation. Um, uh, and the last question I had is, um, are you going to be doing anything to the existing pool accessory building relative to no. the lakefront side? No. No. And, and thanks for asking about that. We, we built that about uh, two or three years ago. Um, uh, and it, it's the, the, the reason, if it's not conforming again, the reason is yep. because no, the I lake came up. I understand completely. Um, and, and everything's okay. changed, so. But that will be the same. Okay. Thank you. Those are my questions. Okay. Other questions I can answer? Um, I see uh, Louise Holland back there. Louise, is this local landmarked or is this beyond a local landmark? I think Louise is going to have something <clears throat> to say about this before we're done. Okay, that's fine. But I'd like to understand that, um, which I think is fantastic. I, but my understanding that this was locally landmarked. Is that right? Okay. Can I, uh, just a basic question. Do we have to consolidate the two lots? It sounds like that's creating, I, and I don't know if there's a preference, but it seems to me that if you didn't have to consolidate and you just could build a pergola on a separate lot, that might offer more long-term flexibility uh, at that site, but I don't know. Per the zoning code, you need to have a principal structure before you can have an accessory structure. Could we give zoning relief, though, from that? Um, I mean, there, I think we have we vacant could. lots in the village. Yeah, they'd have to go back because we didn't notice it up. And, and the only reason I, I ask is I, I worry about a beautiful old house getting torn down, too. And sometimes some of the things that can drive that is someone looking at a great big lot thinking, well, I could put a great big thing here. And if you've got two lots, you might have more flexibility in terms of your future ability to sell one, keep the other. Um, sometimes things that drive those decisions, I think, by homeowners are our staggering property taxes. Maybe that's not a concern for you, but it might be a concern for a future owner. So just in the interest of 
what's best for that house. I'm wondering, do we want to consolidate the two lots? I'm happy to grant this relief, but I'm just wondering if there's a better relief. Um, to grant that relief, uh, it would need to go, we didn't notice that, so it would need to go back before the advisory, uh, the zoning board for the variation request. I mean, I'm happy to grant this relief, but I, I would be happy to grant that relief too. And frankly, I think that would, it probably wasn't considered because it wasn't thought of as an option, but we sort of have the ability to think up options. <laughs> and and it, it, it's something I would, perhaps we could grant this relief, and if you wanted to go ask for that, you could. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just trying to think if there, I, I mean, you can grant any relief you can vary any zoning requirement under our zoning ordinance. Yeah. It's just not typical that we allow someone to have an accessory use without a principal use. Well, it might also create in the future a problem with somebody coming back and saying, I want that same kind of relief. It might create a precedent. I'd, I'd be okay with that. Um, and the reason I'd, I'd be okay with that precedent, again, it's thinking about the economics that drive the destruction of beautiful old big houses in this town. It's you see a great big lot and you see what you could put on there and you have a lot more options. You know, we had we've had homeowners come in here and do the opposite of this for that this very reason. Um, and if all we really want on this property is a pergola that you guys can use, it seems to me that that's what we ought to be doing. But if you want to consolidate it, God bless you. I don't care. I'm happy to grant that, too. But I think the way this has been constructed now as we've tried to make the entire um, back uh, um, a bluff all integrated. Sure. Um, so I think we're, we're okay with it being consolidated. Um, the, the taxes are getting crazy. Um, so, I mean, it, it's been, you know, but on the other hand, I think we, we, we bought this in 2001, I think it was, or 2002. So, you know, wow, all of a sudden 18 years flew by. Um, and, and all the kids are growing up, and it's, I, where did it all go? But, um, but the taxes definitely went up, have gone up dramatically. So I think you're right about that. Um, I don't know. I, I, I would hope that nobody could, I hope there'd be a lot of opposition to anybody ever tearing down a historic house. I don't know, Luis, if you there, there would be, actually there'd be do no that, legal but that way to stop it is the problem. There's no legal way to stop it. Not really. No. We can delay, but we can't really stop it. And 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 that's so the underlying economics. Well, maybe because the, this house is protected, right? So so I mean, I put my heart and soul into restoring oh, this, so it would right. it would break my heart if somebody it would break our. I would never knowingly sell it to somebody who would do that. Um, but you never know what people do once they control something. I'm just and that's actually part of stewardship, isn't right. it? Is making sure that when you pass it on, it's passed on to the appropriate parties rather than, you know. I, I feel that, that, that way, sir. I feel like I'm just a steward temporarily for this really but we do. historic thing. And, and it would just break my heart if somebody did what um, Mr. Kripe suggested. But there has been a recent example of, um, you know, a very well-maintained historic home on the lakefront being being torn down. So, um, you know, it, we do unfortunately have the recent experience. Was that that large red brick? Yeah. yeah. I was shocked that that <laughs> happened. As we all were, right? Exactly. So that's why that's why we're trying to think. Wait, was that landmark status? No. Um, no, but our landmark preservation ordinance does not prevent teardowns, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, um, as the way the ordinance was written. Um, well, we're not asking for that release, yeah. r relief, but I, I would want to protect this home. If you change your mind, feel well, free to come back and ask us to subdivide it, because I would grant that. <laughs> because, well, I'm looking, I'm looking right now at the existing 421 Sheridan lot, and it's, it, if, it, if you were to go for subdivision again, that would be a non-compliant lot, right? Is that correct? On page... Um, Right. 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 Going forward, but yeah. right. but but they'll have what? Won't they have m multiple nonconformities? If somebody bought it from me and wanted to put a new house up, wouldn't they have? They would. I bet there'd be twenty ways you could stop them.
village council to deny grants in their affiliation. Um, I, you know, I think the issue. You're saying if we did not consolidate, they would have to go through the. No, I, I'm sorry. I was confusing the two issues. I was talking about if, if after this is consolidated and they wanted to come back and just build something on that other lot, um, I mean, I guess I can confirm on the, uh, the lot with. I, I'm sorry, I know this must seem completely counterintuitive to you. Yes, <laughs> you've gone through all this to, to uh, consolidate. I, yeah, I, I, but I think we really need right. to just focus on the request yep. that's at the, on the table. Right. Okay. Right. Yep. We, you know, we can brainstorm this thing to death. Right, and, right. And, uh, we just wanted to bring that up to you. So just as, uh, Clearly the applicant is, is, is requesting to uh, yep. uh, consolidate his lot, and, and that's what we really need to be considering. It's, I think it's good that we try to help him out with some ideas, but... Uh, well, I would just hope if, um, I mean, hopefully, hopefully we're not uh, selling for a long time. <laughs> we don't plan to go anywhere, but <laughs> but if it ever does get sold, I hope whoever buys it keeps it. And if they don't, I hope whatever group is sitting in your seats at that time does everything they can to block somebody from tearing this beautiful old home down. Well, I, I, I might suggest, too, with, with, with all the investment that you put into the property, it makes it much less likely that that <laughs> of this stature would you know w w would head to the wrecking ball right off the bat. I mean, you know, the way you're maintaining this place and the way that you're enhancing it, really, I think the value is in what you've done with it and what you continue to do with it. And you know, we 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 obviously want to encourage you to do that because that's what makes this community really special too. So, uh, and yes, there are profiteers out there that. Uh, you know, have substantial checkbooks and and uh, don't really don't really seem to care about those sort of things as well but uh, at the same time we have to rely on our residents to do what you're doing to make the track the property so attractive that nobody would ever think of tearing it down and uh, in my estimation that's what you're doing here so thank you very much yeah. and, and you know the, the the gentleman that I bought from r r right as we were about to sign he said just please take really good care of it and if anything make it better and he really <laughs> I mean, it, it has had that it very much filled. My heart's very much with you, so thank you. Well, in a perfect world, that's the way these properties should pass, but yeah. they don't always happen that way. So, But that's the promise he wanted, and I've mm -hmm. tried to keep that. And, thank you, Mr. Satter. We appreciate it. And it's nice to see in this lovely new brochure, uh, Winneka Landmarks, that you're number seven <laughs> in the brochure. <laughs> I didn't even know that. Yep, yes. there you are. So that's terrific. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, okay, we'll open up the microphone to the public. Uh, would anybody like to speak on this item, please? Uh, Louise Holland, 545 Oak Street. I am chairman of the Landmark Preservation Commission. The village of Winnetka is fortunate to have 29 structures designated as local landmarks. Six buildings listed on the National Register of Historic Places and two National Historic Landmarks. A National Historic Landmark cannot be touched. It's, uh, it's like Mount Vernon. Uh, we have two in one little village. Of all our historic homes, there are three located as through lots from Lake Michigan to Sheridan Road. One is a very special restoration, 419 Sheridan Road. The Landmark Commission has monitored the many efforts to create a perfect restoration of a home built in 1928. Architect Mayo and Mayo, the Henry Windsor Jr. House. The Landmark Commission applauds the council's vote this evening to add to the thoughtful addition of the property at 429 Sheridan. The commission thanks the owners of 419 for the many years of careful efforts to make this property truly a landmark of special note in the village. And uh, there are ways to protect your home. Mr. Satter, you can put easements on the home, uh, on the deed, and they can be directed uh, to Landmarks Illinois, and that would prevent any demolition of the house. 
in perpetuity. So there, there are a number of legal procedures that you can do. But you're going through some now, and, and these are wonderful. And, and just as a neighbor of this home, the beauty of the consolidation is that another home cannot be built on 429 Sheridan. And that accrues to the benefit, benefit of the home just to the north. The home to the north has more light, more air, more grass, more beautiful gardens to look at. Um, this is a wonderful solution. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. Would anybody else like to speak to this matter? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back up here. Any uh, additional thoughts, comments, questions? You know, from the standpoint of an accessory building as, you know, a pergola, which is basically a wood frame, I think there's no problem here in terms of, um, you know, granting um, the variation. And I also, I found the letter, brief letter, from the neighbors of the north compelling. Yeah. I mean, that's the, you know, at least the immediate impact is on that neighbor, right. uh, Mr. Guthrie, and he couldn't be more delighted. Uh, that his property's going up in value and he's got a nicer uh, view out of his window. So, um, you know, win, 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 I think. Yeah. Yeah, th thank you. I'm also a neighbor. I run by your house almost every morning. It's beautiful. And anything that you can do to protect it and enhance it, I, I appreciate. So thank you. Uh, Okay, I've been given the option here of uh, waiving introduction. Uh, Annie, I know that I know that's not your favorite thing, so I, I, no problem if you'd, you'd rather uh, no, there wait for somebody to come out of the... Well, we heard from the neighbor, so that's the important thing, so... Okay, you. so you okay? I'm good. Okay, good. Then I'll uh, ask for a motion to waive introduction of no ordinance number M2-2020. So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Trustee Kaladarji? Yes. Trustee Lamphere? Yes. Trustee Dearborn? Yes. Trustee Cripe? Yes. Motion carries. We'll move forward. May I have a motion to adopt ordinance number M2-2020? So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Trustee Dearborn? Yes. Tr Trustee Cripe? Yes. Trustee Kaladarji? Yes. Trustee Lamphere? Yes. Motion carries. Mr. Satter, you don't have to come back here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It is a pleasure. And thank you so much for what you're doing. We're behind you all the way. Okay. Moving on, moving on to item 8C, uh, stormwater. In December, District 36 approved an intergovernmental agreement with the Village of Winnetka to allow the construction of underground stormwater storage beneath a portion of the Crow Island School property. This agreement approves certain zoning approvals for District 36 in the event it ever decides to pursue future improvements on its property. The approval resolution for the agreement will be discussed and voted on tonight, and a public hearing will be held to gather public comment on the zoning relief uh, resolution that is part of the approval package. First, Public Works Director Steve Saunders will review the stormwater agreement with District 36. Then we'll hold the public hearing where the Community Development Director David Schoen will review the zoning approvals, and then Council will hear public comment. So, Steve, you can kick it off. Thank you. Good evening. Get this set up here. Where am I looking, David? There we go. Okay, so uh, just by way of uh, background, thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, just uh, a little bit of history that, that uh, this springs out of a intergovernmental agreement that was negotiated with the Cook County Forest Preserve uh, in 2017. 
um, to provide a significant amount of stormwater storage on Forest Preserve property. The, uh, there were some conditions that went with that, that the Forest Preserve uh, was not to be the only uh, storage location, and there were to be some upstream uh, improvements on other open spaces within the village. So subsequent to approval of that agreement in 2017, we spent roughly almost two years uh, working with Nutri High School uh, to get an intergovernmental agreement for some under, underground stormwater uh, storage uh, and an improvement on uh, Duke Child's Field. That intergovernmental agreement was approved by the uh, Nutri High School Board and Village Council in June of uh, 2019 and serves really as the pattern for the intergovernmental agreement that's uh, before you uh, with District 36. Uh, we, we held our timing a little bit in negotiating with District 36 uh, because they had some other things on their plate uh, with the uh, uh, referendum that was uh, uh, discussed in the, at length in the village uh, earlier this year. Uh, and subsequent to that sort of rolling out, uh, we were able to spend some time negotiating with District 36 specifically to construct uh, underground stormwater storage uh, on the Crow Island School uh, property. Uh, and essentially the, the mm -hmm. basis of the agreement is to allow the village to use a certain portion at the far southern end of uh, the Crow Island School property uh, and then also to uh, reserve some space at the southern end uh, of the property for District 36 usage uh, going forward uh, should they uh, come to some conclusion that there are uh, there is a need for uh, future school improvements uh, to the Crow Island School, uh, so we had a significant amount of back and forth trying to figure out exactly where the boundaries of the village's underground storage and the uh, school district's uh, kind of potential building zone. Uh, would be located, and we settled on an arrangement roughly like this. Uh, so. Uh, sorry, that was, uh, <laughs> I could correct it now if it would be helpful, but that's, that's Crow Island, so, okay, thank you. Apo apologies for that. Um, uh, that is because the agreement was uh, molded on the Duke Child's uh, agreement, so apologies for that. Uh, I'll get a corrected copy for loading on the Village's website. Um, so the, the arrangement of the underground storage would provide about 10.8 acre feet of storage uh, and really this location is key for two reasons. Uh, one, this is really the only kind of significant accessible <coughs> open space that would serve the watershed for the south of Willow Road area. Uh, and then two, uh, as part of the agreement with the Cook County Forest Preserve, uh, we have to provide uh, some water quality improvements. Uh, and again, this is really the only location within that southern watershed uh, where we have sufficient space uh, to provide uh, some of the water quality improvements that we've committed to uh, to the Cook County Forest Preserve. Uh, so this, uh, this agreement would essentially uh, define the scope and preliminary design of those underground uh, stormwater storage improvements, uh, as well as a designated area and some zoning relief that uh, uh, David Schoen uh, will discuss uh, shortly uh, for potential future school improvements. Uh, it provides for cooperative design and review of both projects to make sure that, that neither project negatively impacts uh, the other. Uh, there are some shared project benefits, particularly uh, for District 36 uh, in, the, in the sense that, that construction of these underground improvements would provide for some of the regulatory uh, stormwater uh, storage and detention that would be required uh, for a potential uh, expansion for the school, um, which would, would uh, basically save the, the two taxing bodies, somebody's going to have to construct that. Uh, and, and so by constructing uh, sufficient stormwater storage, uh, there's not the need for double uh, construction of, of uh, stormwater storage. And it also provides an easement agreement uh, that, that would uh, uh, implement uh, this on school property. 
uh, the, the construction uh, windows are laid out in the agreement. There's essentially four separate construction windows that would start in March of a given year uh, for, co for construction on the school property uh, and then wrap uh, by the start of the following fall school year. So from March until roughly late August uh, of any one of four uh, construction windows. Um, there's a term in the agreement that the village would reimburse District 36 for abandoned engineering expenses if for some reason the village were to decide not to pursue the project. Uh, and then the subject, uh, similar to the agreement that was negotiated with uh, uh, dis uh, Nutrier School District, uh, the village would credit District 36 for stormwater utility fees paid. Again, it says Duke Child's Field. I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, paid for uh, on the on the uh, Crow Island uh, project. Uh, so that's sort of a summary of the uh, agreement and the village's uh, construction project. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. Great. Any uh, questions for Steve? Um, yeah, I have I have a few. Um, uh, first of all, um, if you can clarify. Um, given the potential building zone, 100% um, uh, of their stormwater needs would be covered in the stormwater detention we're providing, or potentially would they pr need to provide additional, would, would District 30, 36 need to provide additional? Um, uh, the 10.8 acre feet that we're constructing uh, would include sufficient volume for their regulatory stormwater needs associated with an expansion. One of the things with, with this uh, property is that the area into which the school would plan on expand is already heavily paved. Uh, and so the amount of impervious surface that would be added to that area is perhaps less than if they were moving into a kind of an undeveloped green area, which will have an impact on how much uh, additional stormwater runoff would have to be accommodated. But so, you know, what was there an estimate that was used in terms of like what percentage of of the detention? Just to understand. No, because District 36 doesn't really have that. Well, kind they, they of don't. Penny, they valued it at about three million dollars. No, no, I don't mean I don't mean money-wise. I mean in terms of um, volume, right? Uh, well, the zoning. I mean, obviously, they have no plan. So, I mean, right. but, but you know, surely there was a well, in a, in a big store, an envelope that was used. There's 10.8 acres of storage. You're saying in your uh, model for the large. 100-year, 50-year storm or whatever, how much of that underground acreage would be consumed? Well, that's, a, that, that's one way of, of thinking about it. But actually, the project that we would construct in its entirety is closer to 200 acre feet of storage. There's 109 acre feet available in the Forest Preserve. There's what would be constructed at Duke Child's Field in the Park District. And then this 10 acre feet is about 6% of the total. Right, but I think what Penny's so, saying is if school expands and additional stormwater is created, runoff is created from that, you're saying here that the 10.8 acres is beyond what we need in total in that location, is yes. what I would understand. Yes. To some extent, whatever. Yeah, yeah just, just, just for a comparison, when Nutra High School uh, figured their building expansion and the additional parking lot and the turf fields and all of that. Uh, plus, they're building in the floodplain, so they have floodplain storage, which uh, the Crow Island, this part of the Crow Island property isn't. They came up with something less than seven acre feet for so for that size. So, so this would be much smaller than that, especially given that much of the area is already paved. So right. one or two acre feet tops, maybe. Right. And certainly, I mean, that's why the back end would be preferable to build on because if they went to the, I mean, any place else they would build on would be green space, which would take up more, I mean, it would be more difficult from a flood plain standpoint. Um, the other question is if you could um, describe a little bit more relative to um, the relief that we would be granting as part of this agreement to them, um, you know, it's how that David. would affect. What? It's David's thing. Yeah, so, him yet. Oh, you, I'm yeah, there, sorry. There's all, there's all separate uh, I'm, uh, I'm zoning overlapping. Resolution. Okay, great, great. Um, okay, that was the question I had there. Any other questions? 
Okay. Uh, does anybody in the audience have questions relative to the stormwater component of this? David will be up to talk on the zoning piece after we get done with this, but I figured... When do we open the public hearing, by the way? Right after this right. item. Oh, after I'm done with Steve. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you have technical questions related to the installation of the stormwater storage facility, this would be the time to come up to the microphone and, and speak to those issues. Then we'll open the public hearing, David will make his presentation, and then we'll talk about the zoning issues more specifically at that time. So does anybody have any questions to see relative to the technical aspects of it? Okay. One thing I will say, Steve, that, that, that you kind of skipped over, and I think it's really an important point uh, for the public to understand, is this the idea of allowing the school district to use the storage facility as a credit for their required compensatory storage is a big savings for the taxpayers. I mean, yes. you hit on it that, yeah, somebody has to pay for it, but if we're paying for it through our stormwater project, it's just a, a few million dollars less that the school district has to invest if they ever decide to expand their facilities there. So it's important with all of yeah, these, there's, right. there really is a, a cooperative savings to the, to the benefit of the community because we're building something that will actually have dual purpose, one giving them MWRD credits to not have to build it on their own, and number two, giving the entire area a lot of stormwater relief that they need. So. And giving it's all coming out of the same taxpayer pocket. Right. Yeah, right, right. right. That's, it's a cooperative rather than competitive, yep. so it's yep. great. Okay. Now I guess I got a whole other thing to say here, or I guess I don't. <laughs> Peter. Where's my, where's my patter? Quick question. Should we go ahead and vote on the IG or wait till the zone? No, yes, we, we got to hear the whole thing. Oh, here's the public hearing. Yeah, so, somehow. Nice okay, this is... Uh, the second piece, which is resolution number R1-2020, intergovernmental agreement. No, that's not it. <laughs> it's so awkward in terms of... I'm out of practice, folks. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, resolution number R2-2020, Crow Island Schools zoning relief in conjunction with village stormwater improvements. This is a public hearing and adoption. Uh, I now open the public hearing. And our first order of business in the public hearing is for uh, our community development director, David Schoen, to review the uh, aspects of the uh, zoning relief requested in, in conformance with the agreement. David, go ahead. Okay. So uh, just as a reminder to the council and members of the public, the council recently amended the zoning ordinance to provide you with the authority to hold the public hearing on zoning relief uh, when another public agency is requesting it in relationship to a stormwater improvement project that the village has. And so that's why we're here this evening uh, for the public hearing and then for your consideration. So the, the two components, one, it's Crow Island, uh, District 36, another public agency uh, who uh, would like to have um, some assurances in terms of what they can do on the remainder of their property, as uh, Steve said, after we install our stormwater improvements on their property, which um, you've seen this image before during Steve's presentation. Um, so uh, this again is a, a zoning map on the left showing that the property is zoned R2 and um, is surrounded by R2 to the west and south and R4 to the east, R5 to the north. What I just would like to mention now is um, under our zoning ordinance, um, all institutional uses must meet the same standards as a single family home. Um, under our zoning regulations, we don't have separate standards for institutional uses, as in some communities they will. They may allow institutional uses in a residential district, but they'll have separate standards for those uses. Uh, we, we don't have that, and it may be something we want to consider. Um, so often, um, almost all of our institutional properties have had to request some sort of variations in order to um, construct on them. It's not necessary. 
uh, absolutely necessary, but uh, many of our properties have had to re receive uh, variations. And so in, in this instance, this is the aerial showing a, a larger area and the location of the proposed future uh, uh, potential school building expansion. Um, so what the school district is asking is that um, of four zoning uh, regulations that we provide them with um, some parameters in which if and when they should decide to build an ex expansion of the school at this site that um, when they start to work on that they have some idea of what they have the right to do. And so that's gross floor area, lot coverage, and permeable surface, as well as the minimum side yard setback on the west. Just one thing I want to mention is with gross floor area and how we calculate it, um, the school, if they should decide to build a gymnasium in that um, a floor, for every 14 feet of height, it's considered a floor. So once you go over 14 feet of height, then it's another floor, even though it's a big open space. And the idea is we're trying to regulate bulk through gross floor area. So if the school wanted to do a 36 foot tall, 10,000 square foot building, that would be 30,000 square feet of gross floor area, though the gym would just have a 10,000 square foot footprint. So I just want to explain that in terms of the 90,000 square foot number um, contemplates them having um, some sort of gymnasium possibly in the future on this site. And that's why that number is so large. So I wanted to explain that. Um, so even in granting this relief, the school district will have to come back before the village council to get approval for any improvements made on the property. So they will have to go through the special use process at a minimum. And if they request any variations that we don't contemplate here on um, zoning regulations, they will have to request those as part of that special use process. So even though we are granting some general parameters now for the school district to build on this site, we'll have to go before the village council and we will notify the neighbors and the public of that public hearing and they will be provided the opportunity to participate um, in that process. So with that, um, I just a little a uh, little bit of background relative to um, the institutional uses um, when we did the prior um, uh, the 2020 plan the prior comprehensive plan is Louise is not here anymore, but um, we did uh, analysis of our institutional uses. And first of all, they're all, they are mostly all in uh, residential areas. And secondly, there wasn't anything there was they the uses had been there for a long time, so there wasn't really any standardization in terms of how they sat on the property. So um, the decision was made at that time to um, make them special uses within within the residential zone and providing, I mean, obviously, a residential standard is not applicable when you're talking about an institutional use, but um, providing uh, the description gives it some kind of a, a measure within what what the what the residential standards would be and to provide some kind of a context for that so you know obviously any variation request is going to be way over but um, the volume the GFA um, is the same kind of volume it's being standard relative to how you would measure mass for the residential unit so that was that was how that was done previously you know again it may be worth a look again but that was how we got to where we are um, so just so I understand, um, then we, the village is not granting any relief in advance. It's basically just credits for the stormwater. No, in no. terms of if they come in yep. with a building, um, under 90,000 square feet gross floor area, um, under 75,000 square feet of lot coverage, under 180, uh, 138,000 square feet right. of um, 
um, permeable lot coverage, they will not have to ask for that relief at that point. We are giving them that relief at this point. So the approval of that will be still required. Need relief under the special use process. Correct. And, and the other thing is they can't, in addition to granting variations, this actually also confines them to a, a buildable area. To the footprint. Yeah, they can't go beyond that red box. Or they, they can't go on top of the tank. So the red box defines the potential buildable area. So they can't go under that under the intergovernmental agreement. Right. So the zoning relief is um, applicable to within the red box. Right. It's not a right. It's not a general relief yeah. in terms of the size of the Correct. improvement. But your your comment there, any school improvements will require at a minimum special use approval. I I'm kinda confused like that yeah, might right. be a little bit sounds to me like they still would come back for approval even though we approved these measures. Yep. We've just... Is that, is that a kind of yes. a mis Yes. To make sure no, whatever they do... That's exactly correct. But, but it's the neighborhood. Right. No, we, no you've what we've approved motion. is that... It, and, and this is complicated. Andy, you can go ahead and take it. <laughs> this yeah. is all... So these are a lot of work these that. technical requirements <laughs> are requirements that are largely driven by the nature, the stormwater concerns in the property. And so the relief was given basically reflecting their contribution to our stormwater system. But what remains is still going to be neighborhood concern that an appropriate building is put in place, that the use is appropriate and sensitive to the use of the neighborhood. Um, that's always a challenge and a concern with any of our schools and any of our neighborhoods. It's just the nature of our community. That discussion doesn't change. That we, that discussion will still have to happen. Frankly, it has to happen for the district to be able to finance anything they want to do. So there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff they'll have to do. But even once they do their whole thing, just like when we had to approve new Trier, that whole process still comes up to us. It's just we're not going to be dealing, debating technical basically stormwater related measurements. So the design review board would have to right. go through the process. Right. They you can't have like a skyscraper purple gymnasium. It's, it's not going to happen. Um, and so the footprint that the footprint would have to be within the red box, the red box, which goes beyond, or is that just an optical illusion? Does it go beyond the, the, uh, to the east, does it go beyond the no. building line? So it doesn't. you can see the building line up and down there on the yeah. And it, the red it, box it, isn't red to suggest line that that's yeah. what the thing would look like. Yeah, it's, yeah. Well, it's yeah. A potential area. You know, they <laughs> no, might want to go a little bit off one side. They might want to go off another side. They might want to, you know, but they don't. You know, it it just defines a possible area for them in the future. If so I think it makes sense. Okay, so even even that footprint is not exact. That's just a no. Uh, that's not at all. Not like, uh, at all. No, I mean I don't mean I mean I just yeah. mean a footprint in terms of with, within which the 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 a building could go. Right, and and given the historic nature of that building, you should also expect that anything they put in there is going to have to be yeah, sensitive to that building right. because they also have to go through landmark. Don't worry, I've been a steward for the right. building for you know. Yeah, so they have to right. go through that's the okay. state of Illinois for that. So, <clears throat> yeah. So what we're talking about are very technical measurements that are frankly driven by stormwater concerns. Yeah. I, mean, I think I have a way of simplifying it that, that will probably help you guys too. Steve, how big is the red box square footage wise? Oh. Oh, it's. it's. Huh? No, but the point I was going to make is that. The, the, this isn't the best graph, David. It's not your fault because I didn't have a chance to tell you how we might want to present this so that it was a little bit clearer. But the point is, is, is we are allowing an additional 20,000 square feet of lot coverage, okay? Potentially, 10,000 of which potentially could be a gym. So the way they looked at it is, look, we got to reserve about 10,000 feet if we want to build a gym. And we need several other classrooms, so give us seven to ten thousand feet for that. Okay, you put those two together, you have twenty thousand feet of ground area. That box is probably three times that, Steve. Yeah, oh, easily. easily. So, so the box represents 
an area of which only a third of that potentially will be built in. It, 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 it isn't meant that the whole box gets filled up with building. And then the really with this relief specifies that that whole box will definitely not be filled up, but they can reach to the outer limits of it. Let's say, and, and, I'm ju and to, just to help you understand some of the conversations we have with the school district, if you look at that up and down portion where the classrooms are, you know, where the bump outs are, you can see that. Just imagine if that continued in a straight line down, okay? If they had to do four extra classrooms, it would get them maybe to the, to the bottom or to the south end of that red box with that extension of the wing. And then a gym obviously would be tucked over on the, the west side uh, and attached to the, the school building to the north along the western line. But they don't know. You know, they, they, they just don't know how this is all going to work. They don't know where it's going to fit. Uh, and that was part of the big struggle with coming up with numbers was, was actually negotiating them into something that we felt would at least pass an initial sniff test, from, sniff test from a size and a configuration standpoint with the community, not giving away the farm, and that we could actually provide enough stormwater credit to make it of, of value to them. So. That's why this is confusing. You see this big red box, and it's like, oh my God, that'd be a huge addition. Yeah, no, I, I understand and that. Another way to think about the, the red box, it actually pushes them back further than they could currently build with the current setbacks. Right. Um, right. And so that, you know, they actually, it's not just that they've gotten some, they're, they're actually giving up something as well. Uh, currently, their setbacks would actually be much further south uh, yeah. than, than what they'd be confined to with this approval. Um, um, I know you said the figure earlier, or somebody did, um, relative to um, with a gym, given that every 14 feet is a floor. Mm -hmm. So roughly, if you have a 10,000 square foot, was that the GFA or that was just the, the, um, the, the lot, lot coverage. coverage? So if that was the lot coverage, what would the GFA roughly be for a gym? A gym, it'd probably be 30,000 square 30,000 square feet. Okay, thanks. Zoning relief contingent at all on moving forward with the stormwater project? So this is granted irrespective of whether the project? This is, but not special use or anything else. Right, but this is granted. Right. Okay. okay. Is that the case with? Um, You'll see it in a few weeks, too. Yeah. And Nutrier. Yeah, okay. Nutrier was already granted. Sorry, I missed that. Could you just say that again? The question, the question is whether or not the zoning relief is contingent on whether the stormwater goes through either at all or as proposed or what have you and this is my understanding separate and distinct from how the project occurs what, what a, that's not correct well you got to give something to get something but right but if the and, plan and coming in we have nothing and so in order to induce them into uh, allowing us to put a, uh, a storage field under a portion of their property, uh, there's the tit for tat is, sure, we'll agree to allow you to install it. Whether you install it or not is, is up to you. Don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't no. object to that at all. I think there's been a lot of brain power put in on both sides to this agreement. But I think it's right to, be clear. <laughs> it's right to surface what the, you know, yeah. what the terms of trade are here. Right. One distinguishing feature between this agreement and New Trier is that New Trier had fully developed plan <clears throat> for the property. Yes, over there. fully developed plan. Yes, and, the, and District Thirty Six does not. Yeah, they may do nothing forever. Right, right. But they wanted to at least have an, an, an understanding that they could do something of reasonable scope and size uh, as. The consideration for allowing us to move forward on on their property, and if for some reason uh, we do not, the village does not go forward with installing the stormwater, the easement would still be granted. I mean, that would that would be held in perpetuity, or would that go away? That this our portion of the agreement. When we, before we start construction. 
Yeah, we, okay. we can put tanks in. I mean, we'll have the ability to put tanks in. Well, yeah, but I mean, if for whatever reason we don't get the financing or something falls apart, we, we can, it will, could be done 20 years from now. Yeah, on a okay. rainier day. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to that day. No. Okay. Thank one, you. one other related question, and Chris, this might be for you, but, mm -hmm. um, and it may not be the time to ask the question, sure. but on the stormwater credits, mm -hmm. are those contingent on the, you know, so if, if we didn't do the stormwater project, would we be crediting them for, you know, retention, you know, if they ultimately built? I don't know. No. What's in the agreement? <laughs> the, the stormwater credit becomes effective upon completion of the, completion of the, project. the tank. It's, the project. Yeah, okay, it's, it's the, the same project. as what we did at Deep Child. Okay, so that is, that is, yeah. uh, is uh, in tie together. Yeah. yeah. So even, if they, even if they don't drill yeah. deep. If we don't build the underground detention, they're still limited to that footprint, which limits them from going further south and does limit them. So we do get the benefit. We'll of have an easement, so they can't, yeah. Right, they're still limited. Yeah. They can't go outside the red box is what it boils down to. And they can't build anything bigger than uh, 20,000 square foot of lot coverage at a max. Uh, and just so everybody understands, you know, when you're doing this from a negotiating standpoint, uh, there's what they want to do, and then the usual, oh, we better build in some contingency and some safety factor. Uh, you know, if, if I had folks from the school board here, uh, I doubt if one of them would, would say that they would support a 10,000 square foot gym. I mean, most of the conversation you know, centered around a 7,500 square foot gym, but they wanted the opportunity to think about a 10,000 square foot gym, and they didn't want to lose the opportunity to think about it. And remember, when we do this as a government thing, we're thinking about 20, 30, 40, 50 years into the future, yeah, right. and maybe somebody who doesn't even live in this community, you know, might like the opportunity to think about a 10,000 square foot gym. So there's that sort of negotiation going on. Do they need another 10,000 square feet for three classrooms? Well, no. But what if it's four? What if they have an accessory building for storage of whatever? There's all sorts of these conversations that went on during the process. And so, you know, their wish list is obviously much larger than what they would probably end up doing. Well, what I can tell you from the standpoint of having been on the school board before, um, you know, is that over the course of the 30 years that I've lived in this community, the requirements, the mandates from the state that, that of the types of services that the school district is required to provide is requiring more space in a building for the same number of, of students. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's something that was never envisioned 30 years ago. And so it is responsible for us to leave them flexibility for completely un- um, imagined uh, requirements in the future. So, um, you know, I, it's it's important that we provide that for, you know, for our future families. It's not something that will happen tomorrow, but, you know, 20 years from now. Well, and now the cell job is, is remember that, you know, because of the historic nature of this building, they got a lot of work before they could even put a shovel into the ground on anything. Because Pearl Island would be, let's see, what number in here? <laughs> And that's a national landmark, so I mean, it's it's a very high standard, and and those of you who live really close to the place, would you know be should be comforted in the fact that they have to jump through a lot of hoops, and and certainly whatever they append to the existing building, should be pretty much in keeping with. In fact, I would I would like to offer I would like to offer to anybody anybody on the council. In fact, I would love to offer this to you or to any staff members or anybody else. Um, I've been a docent for the building for a long time, and I would love to take anybody through the building that hasn't had um, uh, a tour of it. As you know, it's a really great way to talk about education in Winneka and about the importance of the building. Um, it was designed in 1939 and continues to be an incredibly um, uh, great educational space. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an advocate for whatever plans the district may have, but just to understand the resource that we have, I'd be, I, the offer stands open, so anytime. One, one thing I would just like to say, frankly, out of gratitude to the school district, um, you know, a problem we have in Illinois is we have so many governing bodies 
that nobody can get anything done. If we all spend our time trying to second guess and micromanage each other, that's how you get a state that has way too much taxation and not enough happening. And what I will say for the school district and what I've really appreciated is not one time have they tried to micromanage us mm -hmm. in the stormwater project. They understand that there has been years of work that frankly they don't even understand the technical depth of what we've been going through to try to solve this big problem for our village. They've been very considerate in saying, you know, tell us what you need and we'll try to work around that. By the same token, we're not qualified to talk about what the school district does or does not need. Right. And we're going to respect their judgments and expect that taxpayers engage with them about whether you agree or don't agree with their school district plans. Uh, I said the same thing when Nutria was in front of us. Don't litigate in front of this board <laughs> what you want from a school district that you vote for. You know, bring that issue to them. Obviously, we have very specific concerns that we, we are responsible for, but I think that line of separation is really critical and really important to getting this thing done. And I, I'm appreciative of the way the school district has handled this. Um, and this agreement basically reflects that. The reason there is this big, vague box is because there's a big conversation that needs to happen, and it's not going to happen here. It needs to happen with that school district. Right. And with that said, I think I'd like to now open up the microphone for public comment on the zoning relief. So anybody who would like to speak to this issue on the zoning relief, come on up to the microphone and share your thoughts. This. This. On Steve's part, or well, whatever you. I mean, you can okay. go ahead and talk. Uh, I'm Kimberly Bria, and I live at 335 Glendale Avenue, which is right across from all this. So, first of all, Steve, awesome! It's happening. Stormwater. So, I'm so thrilled for all of that. I think it's just absolutely fantastic. I think it's fantastic that you guys have created an agreement. I think that's wonderful. And David, I know you've done a huge amount of work with the school, putting all this together. Um, so, I'm just going to provide a perspective. Um, because all of this is so fungible, <laughs> nothing is concrete really except what looks like a red box. And here's what I will say. The, the residents of Glendale, and there's only eight of us, find ourselves in a position of very fractured trust with District 36. That was reinforced by the playground situation that happened. And I spoke to the Design Review Board and the Zoning Review Board and this body and everything after the fact um, about what that was like. And um, so there isn't a whole lot of trust there that the, the school district is going to be transparent or as, you know, awesome as it was to get the letter with the, you know, public hearing on it and the new signs and everything else, that they're going to be that clear with us that we'll actually have that opportunity to have that conversation. So I'm registering that publicly that I, that's a personal fear and a collective fear. Um, I didn't realize the gymnasium piece, and all I can imagine is my lovely neighbors who are right across from this looking at a big brick wall, sort of like what the issue was with Nutrier. And that was revised and changed, and you're right, it shouldn't be litigated here. It should actually be addressed with the school board. But I'm saying to this body that it is vastly important that specific conversations happen with the residents of Mount Pleasant and Glendale, specific to anything that the school does, and that giving them this bandwidth doesn't mean, Katie, bar the door, you now get to build a gymnasium that fronts Glendale Avenue. So I, I just would say that. I'm a huge supporter of stormwater, and I'm really looking forward to my basement not flooding anymore. So that would be so awesome. And I think that's fantastic. So, and I appreciate all the hard work that went into this, but that would be my cautionary tale. So that's just point number one. Point number two is really a question did you say the construction of the tanks when that actually happens would start like in March and end at the school year? So yes. it would go from March to end of August. Yes. And then at some point there'll be a conversation around with the neighborhood around how that's actually going to happen. Yes. So that because it's a little, it's a two lane street that goes two ways and there's no lines and the school actually said it would take a week to do the playground, and it was eight, and that was a disaster. So I just want to make sure there'd be a conversation so that we make sure that that works for everybody, right? Okay, yes. awesome, fantastic. Thank you very much. Oh. Um, and Kimberly, I'm assuming you meant you're a fan of stormwater storage rather than a fan of stormwater. <laughs> yes, yes, very specifically, stormwater storage, not stormwater. 
Any other questions, comments? Come on up. Hi, my name is Karen Essig. I just have a question. I know you probably can't address it now, but at what point will the village have clarity on the method of conveyance for the stormwater to the forest preserve? I we imagine are. you're working on it, but yes, we are. Uh, will it be part of the zoning hearing discussion, or we won't have that information then? Uh, that is a an agreement that is going to occur with the park district, not with the school. Uh, if, if you notice in that one drawing that a portion of the, the drainage tanks actually cross out, out of the school property and onto the, the park district property, and then there needs to be a connection from that tank out to, of, you know, fundamentally out, finding its way out to Hibbard. Okay. But that will be an agreement with the, the park district and has nothing to do with the zoning constraints of the, uh, of the school district. Okay. So you'll be hearing about that, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, I'm not sure if you're here or not, but uh, we will be presenting a fairly comprehensive program of park district properties on the 16th of January. We don't know when it is yet, so watch all the websites to see when that, that's posted up for. It's actually a park district meeting where Steve and I, uh, if Andy's in town, he'll be coming and, and others to present to them the entire plan of how we're going to do, how we would like to deal with stormwater on their properties. Okay, thank you. So, what day sure. of the week is that? Thanks yeah, for coming out. Is that? That's a Thursday. Okay. Yeah, it's Thursday. Yeah, okay. Be there. But maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. Uh, anybody else? Yes. Okay, at that point, I will close the public comment and. Uh, I will close the public hearing at this point, and then I'll ask for final council comments. Uh, anybody have any additional things they'd like to add? The, the one point I would make to the, the comment on the neighbors looking at the big gymnasium, I just want to be clear on this, that if the, the school will have to go through the process of special use, go through the DRB, theoretically, it could come to council and not be approved based on design. It could meet all the zoning requirements, but th this is not, to my understanding, this is not approving an, a, approving an improvement to the school that just is within this confine of zoning. Right. It would have to meet all the other design requirements to be sensitive to that. Um, and that is, you may have a distrust of school board, but that's a, that's a village uh, resolution there. That was not noticed. The DRB well, meeting was this, not noticed. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, it would this have was to have been noticed. Just I mean, this was. Yeah. It was publicly noticed. Yeah, I mean, and this is when I, I've, I've been a little squeamish recently about, um, in terms of uh, hearing our variation requests and then um, voting and um, uh, on the final adoption the same evening. And it's for this reason that you know that a, a major issue or an issue is surfaced and we just want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to hear about it and sometimes people don't really understand what's going on until after the initial presentation so if I've seemed um, a little recalcitrant in terms of my um, approving the waiver it's just because I I personally from my years of experience think that there is a purpose to our introducing and discussion and then um, waiting until the next meeting to vote on um, an approval because sometimes questions come up that we hadn't anticipated so um, you know, if it seems like, you know, if it's sort of slam dunk, which some some of them clearly are, or if there's a time constraint, but um, that's why I've been pushing back a little bit because I think there is a reason for for our procedures. Um, so, speaking to that issue, right? Yeah, I can't think. And yeah, our, our, our as you know, our process 
you might not have been happy with, 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 with how it worked or with the, the playground equipment, but I think something this significant will have a lot of public attention, input, and uh, uh, notification well beyond, especially when they have to start to talk about how they're going to finance it and, and how much it's going to cost. Uh, I think everybody will be pretty sensitive to what's coming down the pipe by the time those conversations happen. So, and Actually, two processes whatever the school needs to do to get right. referendum approval yeah. plus our zoning process for special right. right and and i think that as um as a village we do have a value added in this process because although it is incumbent on the school district to develop what educationally is the best it's our responsibility to make sure it fits in the context of the neighborhood and the village so um there is an interface there that you know we we do have a responsibility and do have um a you know, on behalf of the residents of the village to um, take a look at it through a different lens. So I, I think there is a good reason we would look at it. Thanks, Penny. Any other comments from this side? Okay. Nope. Uh, I'd just like to wrap it up and say, first of all, I really want to thank uh, Andy. I want to thank you for all the help. I mean, you know, these negotiations went on for a long, long time. And a lot of the technical ideas of how this whole thing could come together and work and you know relative to the zoning aspects and and some of the shaping aspects that we dealt with uh andy really carried carried a lot of water on this one and uh and helped helped a lot good pun sorry i didn't mean it that way but it's true uh, yeah, thank you uh, and 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 it really is appreciated because uh you know a lot of this stuff is 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 in the weeds for us us common folk and it's nice to have the sort of resource that uh Andy brought to the table on this one particularly to get us to get us over the hump. So thank you very much. Thank you. And with that said, <clears throat> we'll get the show rolling here. So I'll try to get this right now. Before I open my mouth. I can tell Kathy wasn't here. Okay, this is regarding resolution number R1-2020, Intergovernmental Agreement with District 36 for Stormwater Improvements at Crow Island School. Uh, may I have a motion to adopt resolution number R1-2020? So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Trustee Cripe? Yes. Trustee Dearborn? Yes. Trustee Lamphere? Yes. Trustee Caladarchi? Yes. That motion carries. Thank you. Uh, the next item, resolution number R2-2020, Crow Island School Zoning Relief in conjunction with Village Stormwater Improvements. Uh, may I have a motion to adopt resolution number R2-2020? So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Trustee Dearborn? Yes. Trustee Cripe? Yes. Trustee Caladarchi? Yes. Trustee Lamphere? Yes. That motion carries. Thank you very much, and thank you, District 36, and thank you, thank you all for coming out and uh, participating in the conversation. So, we will move forward. Uh, item number nine: old business. There is none. Item number ten: new business. Believe it or not, that was some other business. Uh, none. Appointments: none this evening. And. Item 12, closed session. May I have a motion to go into closed session to discuss specific personnel, collective bargaining, the purchase of, or lease of property not owned, not owned by the village, and setting the price for the lease or sale of a property owned by the village pursuant to sections 2C1, 2C2, 2C5, and 2C6 of the Illinois Open Meetings Act, respectively. Second. Roll call vote. Trustee Caladarchi. Trustee Cripe? Yes. Trustee Dearborn? Yes. Trustee Lanphier? Yes. That motion carries. Uh, the council meeting will adjourn immediately after the closed session. Thank um, you, everybody. Uh, Chris, um, just I first of all apologize for being late. I walked again. I forgot I didn't have a car. Um, but I just wanted to remind everybody that there will be uh, community conversations at Pete with us Saturday from 10 to 11. Great. So.